We're going to call the meeting to order at 4 p.m. Uh, roll call. Trustee Barto. Here. Trustee Matoya. Here. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Arsoilo. Here. Trustee Wygand. Here. Trustee Yelsey. Here. Dr. Smith. Here. Okay, move to adoption of the agenda. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Yes. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Yelsey. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ersoilu? Yes. Trustee Wygand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Okay, community input on closed session items only. Trustee Crane? This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the closed session agenda only. Comments on closed session agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Seeing no comments, we will now move to closed session. The items are A, conference with labor negotiator NMUSD representative Leona Olson, employee organization CSEA, NMFT pursuant to government code section 54957.6, B, public employee discipline slash dismissal slash release slash employment pursuant to government code 54957 and education code 44954B, also public employee discipline, dismissal, release, Government Code Section 54957, and D, Public Employee Discipline Dismissal Release, Government Code 54957. We move into closed session at 401. I'd like to call the meeting to order at 6 p.m. In closed session, the board took action to authorize the superintendent to give notice of non-reelection to certain certificated employees. CE 2022-01, CE 2022-02, who shall be released from their certificated position at the conclusion of the current school year pursuant to Education Code 44954 and 44929.21, and the roll call vote was as follows, seven ayes, zero noes, zero absent. We'll begin with a moment of reflection and Pledge of Allegiance by Trustee Yelsey. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, move to adopt the minutes from February 8, 2022 and March 2nd, 2022. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. It was moved by Trustee Matoy, seconded by Trustee Yelsey. Roll call vote. Trustee Barto? Aye. Trustee Matoy? Aye. Trustee Crane? Aye. Trustee Anderson? Aye. Trustee Ursolo? Aye. Trustee Wygand? Aye. Trustee Yelsey? Aye. Okay. And now we move on to the recognition of our 2021 athletic sports champions. So we've got our recognition of our CAF Southern Section Division 4A girls basketball champions. And Dr. Bauermeister is going to help us with uh, both introductions. So Dr. Bauermeister. President Bartow, members of the board, Dr. Smith, <coughs> cabinet, and distinguished guests, it is my great honor tonight to present you with two CAF champions from Newport Mesa Unified School District. We traditionally recognize our CIF champions after every season of sport, but due to COVID restrictions, we're making up for lost ground tonight. First off, we'd like to recognize our CIF champions from spring of last year. At this time, I'd like to call up Principal Sean Bolton from Newport Harbor High School to introduce the Lady Sailors CIF 4A girls basketball champions from last spring. Dr. Bolton. President Bartow, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, Executive Cabinet, and distinguished guests, thank you for having us tonight. It's an honor to be here. 
Education-based athletics doesn't happen in a vacuum, and since last spring, we've been on a complete roll, and it takes a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving parts, and a lot of support from the district on down. So I'd like to thank the school board for their participation, their inquiry, their curiosity about all education-based athletics at Newport Harbor High School, Superintendent Smith, all your support from the superintendent level, the cabinet level support has been tremendous, and Ms. Olson in HR and the whole HR department for allowing us to hire the best, to retain the best. And we have two coaches tonight. We have Ross Sinclair, who's a teacher coach at Newport Harbor High School, and Jillian Angel, who's also a teacher coach at Newport Harbor High School, both alum, student center teachers, and also tremendous coaches of their programs. And so retaining the best and keeping the best is a priority. Mr. Trader for taking those phone calls from principals when it comes to athletics and all the needs that we have, the endless needs that we have. And thank you, Jeff, for just you know always picking up when I call or calling back right away. I appreciate that. <laughs> Shelly Humphreys in transportation for all those buses that she has to book for all three levels of sport, multiple levels of sport, and also all those CIF championship games on the outer galactic universe of the <laughs> CIF you know, realm. And just, it, it does take a village and it does take a lot of moving pieces and support. And last but not least, Dr. Bauermeister and Ms. Torres for their unyielding support at the cabinet level, the district level, for all the different particulars and all the tentacles that come along with student athletes, coaches, education-based athletics, CIF Blue Book, and on and on and on. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that last year we also had a runner-up with boys volleyball and CIF. But girls basketball really salvaged the entire school year. It was a very <laughs> difficult school year. It was tedious for obvious reasons. The night before graduation, the girls captured the first CIF title in school history. We've been around for 92 years. We've had some tremendous teams. We have an NBA Hall of Famer in George Yardley, but we had not had a basketball title won at the school. It was the first basketball championship banner hung at Newport Harbor High School, and we're very proud of it. And the next day, we were able to celebrate it at graduation. So without further ado, I'd like to call up our coach and math teacher, Jillian Angel, alum of Newport Harbor High School, and two of our players to just say a few words and accept the certificates on behalf of the entire basketball team. And it's all too appropriate that it's Women's International Day, and we're celebrating young women. Hi, I'm Jillian Angel. I'm a math teacher and I'm also the girls basketball coach. Um, so Principal Bolton said most of everything. I want to thank all of you um, for everything that you guys do so that we can go out and, you know, do what we do, coach, go to games. The district does so much so that we can do what we do. And the parents, it's a whole community effort. Um, like Principal Bolton said, it's been, we've had some really good teams and this is the first year we've been building and building. Last year was my sixth year as the head coach. 10th um, year coaching. I'm also alumni. I played at Newport Harbor. Um, so it's been a lot of building and we were able to, with everything, we didn't even know if we were going to have a season. We're usually a winter sport and we got pushed back. We didn't start until after spring break. Um, and we had to move our CIF championship game was supposed to be on the last day of school. We had to actually move it a day early because of graduation. So um, we were able in 24 hours, our seniors won a CIF championship and then graduated high school so that was super cool. I mean just the fact that we were able to get it done and then what we did with the season was awesome unfortunately with it being last season um, we didn't get a whole lot of girls able to come tonight and also um, a lot of them also play spring sports um, so they're multi-sport athletes they're in other games so we have three girls here tonight um, two current seniors and actually one senior from last year who's on just happened to be on spring break this year um, so I'll call them forward so the first one is Emma Coatsworth and the next one is Emma Fultz and lastly we have Willow Rath want to mention all the other girls um, even though they couldn't be here so the other girls that were part of our team uh, were Kate Bland, Vanessa Cornejo, Chase Dionio, Dalen Renee, Sydney Jover, Fiona Lynn, Reese Rasmussen, and Ellie Robinson. Annette 
Annette? <laughs> so one of us? Hello, meaning. I know. <laughs> Good luck with that, Mrs. Sheldon. I have no problem with basketball players. Yeah. <laughs> or volleyball. Just very quickly, I know there's a lot of Trojans here. Willa Rath, who's a senior that graduated, her mom was the point guard on the USC team with Cheryl Miller. Oh. The women of Troy, again, International Women's Day, Tracy Rath is back there. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So just as an interesting side note, Assistant Superintendent Torres asked me who we recognize because this is the first time she's been through this process. And I let her know that we only recognize CIF champions in this district. And there are a lot of districts that recognize league champions, but we have the set, we did the research when we did our 50th a few years ago and found out that Newport Mesa United School District has the second most CIF champions of any district in Southern Section. Right. Only Long Beach, who is twice as old as us and much bigger, has more CIF championships than us. So that's who we recognize. So um, our next, uh, again, with Principal Bolton and Newport Harbor High School, um, to talk about athletic excellence, the 2021 Newport Harbor High School Boys Sailors Water Polo Team is next. Not only did they win the CIF Open Division, but they were regional champions and national champions. So Dr. Bolton, the Boys Water Polo Team from Newport Harbor High School. Thank you, Dr. Bauermeister. And I'd also like to thank Mr. Drake and Dr. Shaka because Nine years ago, boys water polo, you helped it get back on track and it took a few years, but it did. And so thank you for your support on those levels of getting it back on track. And again, water polo, this is the 13th championship for boys water polo at Newport Harbor High School. That's the most in the Southern section. The GPA, we had to actually calculate it manually. We had a little problem with the metric, not a single boy on the team or a young man on the team earned less than a 4.0 with their GPA. And so they're student athletes through and through. And Ross Sinclair is also a teacher on our campus. He's a graduate of Newport Harbor High School. Trustee Matoye, you're his former math teacher at Ensign, <laughs> right? But he's a product of Newport Mesa and just has done a tremendous job. So we really appreciate the recognition, the support. And again, this was the 48th CIF title in our school history. Wow. So without further ado, Coach Sinclair. Ms. Matoya, good to see you. It's good to see how well you've done. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a history teacher now, but I, I really enjoyed math back at Ensign. Uh, yes. so, uh, That's OK. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for all the support. Um, like listening to Miss Angel talk about the uh, basketball team, uh, the water polo team had a phenomenal year. Uh, it's an amazing group of boys, young men, that, that I think are true ambassadors of this uh, program, this, this school, this community, and this school district. So. Um, you got some fine young men up here that deserve this honor. Uh, it was an amazing season, and uh, looking forward to doing it again in the future. So we're with uh, Mr. Altschuler. Come on up. You're first. Alex Altschuler. Or Bean is his nickname. Owen Bartlett. Cole Borgreave. Peter Castillo. Peter Clark, Eric Dusen, Will Fossilman, Finn Gens, Finn Lesseur, Cooper Mathisrud, 
Gavin Netherton. <laughs> Billy Rankin. Tommy Richardson. <laughs> Richie Rimlinger. <laughs> Owen Tift. <laughs> and Gage Vertigal. Uh, two athletes. Two athletes couldn't be in attendance. Mason Hunt is celebrating his mom's 50th birthday party, um, and Ben Lathy, who is a current junior, got asked to play at the senior national team down in Peru at Pan American Games. So right, he's uh, a little busy, but uh, well deserved for both those two boys as well. And school board, I want to just thank you for all the support you've had with the aquatics program. And I know that there's a lot of projects in the in the uh, in the future in the works that we hope can get pushed through. So thank you for everything. I'm going to do a back shot. Other side of water. And squeeze it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't want to mess it up. It's all clear. It's all You look the part, man. <laughs> I love starting our meetings with smiles. So proud. This is why we do what we do. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Um, next, we've got our student board member reports. Report topic after. Do you want? Do you want to be that part? Sure. Um, we've we've been through a lot. Our timing is getting to two years, and we said after fine. Oh, pardon me. Thank the parents for coming. Oh, thank you, parents, for bringing your children and supporting them and yes. doing good water. <laughs> and hoops. What? And hoops. And hoops. And hoops. Oh, yes, ladies. Okay. Um, the, we we did a, a report light topic this month. After finally emerging from two years of the pandemic experience, what are you looking forward to this spring? We wanted some good news. Um, Moss, would you like to start us off, please? Sure. Just make sure the point of the points at your mouth. As long as it points at your okay. mouth, it'll pick it up. All right. President Bartow, Superintendent Smith, board members, and cabinet. As we enter into a new era of vaccines and not masks, a world with no pandemic after living in one for two years, we are entering into a strange space, especially for us in adolescent life. However, even though there will be many struggles to jump back into something resembling normalcy, I think we have so many things to look forward to. For me personally, it will be great to be in school without feeling anxious about accidentally spreading COVID-19 or getting it from someone else. I know that a lot of my friends are looking forward to a prom where they can see more than half of someone's face. I know that parents want to take photos of their children walking at, on, at, walking at graduation. On my own ca campus, Back Bay High School, we are excited to have finally created a dance team. I myself am on the dance team and can speak for all performers and athletes in the district for the importance of exercise and performing without a mask on. Although there will definitely be struggles and we should be cautious, we have a future that's scintillatingly uh, with prosper, diversity, and joy. Thank you very much. 
we're going to hear from Dane and then Katie. Thank you. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Bartow, and members of the board. Um, with mass mandates dropping as of the 12th of March, many students at Estancia are excited about the prospects of school moving back to a somewhat normal state. Some specific examples that I heard from my peers when I talked to them was that they're happy to just see their teachers' faces and be able to see <laughs> uh, other peers. Um, however, the things that students were most excited for are still just possibilities. Uh, students couldn't wait to have indoor pep assemblies back and the possibility of field trips make a return. But the most common answer I got was that students were just happy to be able to possibly eat inside. Um, while many said this because they wanted to escape the recently volatile weather, one student really opened my eyes to a problem at our school. They told me they were concerned about the flocks of people eating outside without masks on in tight groupings. Um, and they argued that in reality, it wasn't any better than just having students eat inside. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, members of the board, President Barto and Superintendent. I am honored to be here this evening. This week, we were asked to address what we were looking forward to in the spring. There are many things coming up for students that we're looking forward to. For the first time in two years, CDM ASB is putting on our annual inclusion carnival where diversity is promoted on campus. From sports to performances to school events such as prom or organizing in-person campaign week, it's a great way to get back to normalcy. There are so many amazing things that Corona Mar High School has to offer. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present tonight. Thank you, Katie. I think we're all excited about spring. It's all, all about buds and flowers. Of course, in California, spring is just like maybe two degrees different than winter. <laughs> but we still look forward to the feel that we get from having a spring, a springtime. Thank you so much for sharing. And just so that you know, we talk about this with all the student board members. We just give them the opportunity to have some of them be able to stay home and do their homework on time. So thank you so much. Thank you. And now we have our Harbor Council PTA report with Lisa Bowler. <clears throat> Good evening, Dr. Smith, President Bartow, trustees, cabinet, guests. Um, yesterday and today was supposed to be our Sacramento Safari um, trek up to Sacramento, which was canceled a couple weeks ago. So we did it virtually. Hopefully some of you were able to join us. And um, we were our second year doing it virtually, so it was a little different. The speakers came to us through a little square on our screen. And um, some of the people that we heard from yesterday, Michelle Underwood, who is the Vice President of School Services, spoke about the budget, the upcoming budget, and the future of school funding. She mentioned the importance of Assembly Bill number 1614, which would be providing sufficient base funding for our schools. We also heard from Peter Callis, who's the director, the division director for career and tech ed at the Department of Ed. He told us about um, CTE grants and incentives and several different programs that are available for our students. Really amazing and a lot of money out there for people to um, look into. We also heard from Edgar Zaruta, I think. He's the Senior Director of Policy for AXA. And I can't tell you what that stands for because I am horrible when it comes to those things, but I know you guys all know what AXA is. Anyway, he explained. <laughs> just Maybe bit. just a tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you could tell us. But anyway. He was very, very knowledgeable and explained how COVID still dominates education policies in Sacramento and in our nation's capital. He talked about the staffing shortages in our schools with both teachers and administrators and also talked about the proposed state budget regarding schools and students. We also heard from our state PTA leaders, um, uh, President Carol Green, the Vice Chairman of Education Advocacy, Beth Meyerhoff, and Sherry Griffith, the PTA Executive Director. 
they kind of gave us a rundown on a lot of the bills that are up in um, Sacramento right now. And today we heard from Assembly Member Murachi, Senator Penn, Senator Men, and Senator Portentino. They all spoke on bills that they are promoting that benefit our children, our students, and our schools. They're, um, the first time in my going to Sacramento where I truly felt that our legislators were, first of all, I was amazed at the number of them who said they had children in public schools in California. In the past, so many of them have had their kids in private school. They didn't always ring true on their wanting the best for our schools. But they were also truly promoting money for our schools and for our children's benefit. And um, we need to look into a lot of these bills that are out there. For example, that AB uh, 1614, when they're wanting the money at the lower level to be increased. And they were mentioning how Proposition 98 is the base of funding for our schools, not the ceiling. And we need to keep that in mind. And um, we need to be contacting our state legislators and letting them know how we feel about these things. And as part of SAC Safari on Friday at 4 o'clock, there are a group of us going to um, visit in person with Senator Dave Mann, and we will be discussing some of these things. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we move on to CSCA and NMFT President's comments. We'll start with CSCA President Pam Saunders. Good evening, President Bartow, School Board, Superintendent Smith, Cabinet, and guests. CSEA appreciates this opportunity to speak tonight. We would like to acknowledge and congratulate our classified employees as we start to take off our masks. It has been two years and we are excited to see everyone's faces again, but still a little scared of the unknown. Classified employees continue to support all students and staff every day in every way. All classified employees continue to support in-person learning. Thanks to the commitment and dedication of classified employees, classified classrooms are clean, meals are served, students are transported to school, technology is updated, and they assist in classroom learning. District communication to all staff members is important to everyone. It's better to receive twice than not at all. Health and safety are important to all students and staff members. We anticipate presenting our initial proposal at the next school board meeting. We would like to remind everyone to follow safe practices as COVID remains with us. Your action impacts everyone around you. Thank you again from CSA Chapter 18. Thank you. Now we have NMFT President Sarah Allwater. Good evening, President Bartow, board members, Superintendent Smith, and cabinet members. It's great to be able to speak to you tonight. I'd like to first speak on the lifting of the masking mandate next Monday. It's taken a long time to get to this point, and we at NMFT are along with everybody else hoping and praying for conditions to keep improving, um, that keep improving county and statewide. And to the teachers and service providers we represent, thank you for the amazing work, flexibility, and resilience you've demonstrated throughout. Next, I wanna report that yesterday we met with Leona Olson, Carrie Torres, and John Drake, along with the high school teacher and a middle school teacher to further discuss the Schoology issues that remain. We look forward to our next productive meeting as we continue to try to facilitate the improved functionality of the platform as there still remains to be some issues. Somewhat related to technology, we're meeting with the district Thursday due to um, a replacement job where teachers are getting their projectors switched out. Um, teachers appreciate new equipment, but there's some issues that have arisen due to the timing of this undertaking. And taken with the rest of everything going on currently, um, we'd like to just, you know, provide some input. Um, there have been a number of large scale changes this year, but we need to remember that employees are still grappling with their regular increased loads due to all things COVID. 
will always benefit from the continued collaborate, collaboration with the district we've committed to even when it allows for a simple heads up that might avoid some unnecessary stress. We're looking forward to upcoming negotiations, working with the district's team, and of course having opportunity to address some of the impacts that have taken place in the last year. Finally, again, I wanna wish everyone well next week at the school sites for a breakthrough we've all been waiting for, and now the data and science finally indicate is the right move. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next, we have item 15A, report on the A through G completion improvement grant. Carrie Great, Torres. thank you. Um, we have the A through G completion grant, which is a new grant that was offered this year um, for the state of California, uh, the California Department of Ed, um, has invested in the nine through 12 campus. And so we have uh, invited Dr. Mike Shaka, who's going to be speaking tonight. He is our director of teaching and learning uh, for secondary, and he's gonna share our A to G plan. Thank you. President Bartow, members of the board, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, guests of the community, and any students who remain, especially our students, thank you for giving me uh, just a few minutes to share our proposal for our Newport Mesa A to G grant presentation. So to begin with, the purpose of the A to G completion grant is really to promote activities that support students' access to A to G completion. In a, in a nutshell, that's really what the funds are designed for. Would you just do a quick little summary of A to G for the public that may not be as Absolutely. So with so us? A to G are the requirements for students to be eligible to apply for our Cal States and UC system. So there are a series of classes that must be taken that must qualify under uh, uh, that must be approved A to G and students take these classes if they take um, all of the required classes they are eligible to apply for our Cal States and UC. So the grant outlines some areas that we can expend these funds. For example, and these are just a few examples, professional development to build A to G understanding, um, creating advising plans to support students, um, expanding access to coursework for A to G, uh, expanding AP and IB classes, and even supporting some of the fees associated with those. These are just some <coughs> of the areas. I think it's important to note that while we are gonna propose some of our funds be focused on only some of these areas, Newport Mesa supports A to G in all of these areas. These funds just won't necessarily be used for all of these. So I just wanna make sure um, we're not neglecting some of these other areas. We're just gonna focus on some of them with these particular monies. Um, some requirements that we just have to review very quickly is um, the, the parameters and, and uh, details that we need to accomplish with this A to G grant. Um, it's got to serve our unduplicated students and we need to spend some time in our application describing how our funds will uh, serve our unduplicated students in terms of A to G access. We also need to identify the number of students that we will serve that we think will, uh, will benefit from these expenditures. It needs to supplant, it needs to supplement, not supplant current, current programs. So we can't just take something we're already doing and shift this money to, to now fund that. We need to expand and, and supplement what we're doing. Um, and then it needs to also expand access for all of our students. So while it has a focus on some of our unduplicated students, it also needs to touch all of our students in some way. And again, another important uh, aspect. There's two components. We need to do an initial proposal, which is what today is. And then it will come back to our next board meeting on the 29th for official approval. So this is just our proposal, and then we're hoping that it will come back for approval at the following board meeting. Can I just so ask a quick question? Because I, I, I know the answer, but I, I, this is my question years ago. Um, what is, why does it benefit students to complete their A through G to the point where the state would put a grant in that direction? Well, I, I think at bottom line, it's options and opportunities. Cal States and UCs might not be for every student, but our goal is to make sure every student leaves Newport Mesa with options so they can make that decision. So the more that students are able to say, I could go to Cal State Long Beach, I could start a career, I could join the military, that's what we want for our students. So expanding that option is not saying it's for every student, it's saying we want every student to have that opportunity. Thank you. 
So the amount is $1.2 million to be spent over three years. So starting next year in the 22-23 school year and ending in the 24-25 school year. So we've got three years to, to spend uh, this, th these grant funds. And our first step was to identify the most prominent barriers to A to G. And so what we did, kind of in the spirit of what we've been promoting in our district, is talk with our stakeholders, talk with the people that have the most insight to get perspective and identify those current most prominent barriers to A to G. So the first thing that we did was we had a focus group with all of our secondary counselors and had an open dialogue to talk with them about what sort of barriers they were experiencing with students and A to G eligibility. We next moved to our um, administrators of instruction, which includes both principals and assistant principals of instruction, to talk with them about their perceived barriers and what they were experiencing. Um, and then finally, we did a uh, sample review of transcripts of some of our last year's seniors to look for trends and patterns. And I can tell you, while trends and patterns exist, rarely is there only one reason why a student might not have met those A to G requirements. So it's not cut and dry where uh, it was only this one reason, but we did see some trends emerge as to why our students were not, um, were, were not becoming A to G eligible. And um, possibly predictably, um, mathematics emerged as, as one of our primary barriers. Um, and mathematics for, for two separate reasons. Um, and a secondary barrier that was, that was um, really interesting to discuss with our, our administrators and our, and our counselors um, was this idea of continuing to expand knowledge of A to G and just the understanding of what it is, its importance, um, how, it, how it plays into students' lives was an area that we felt um, we could grow at some of our schools. Um, other schools felt like it was, it was um, taken care of, but at some of our schools we felt like we could grow a little bit with just building knowledge of students and parents. So with that information, we decided to take a, a kind of a three-pronged approach to addressing um, an increase in A to G eligibility. And you can see two of these are mathematics and one is college and career um, guidance. The first approach is looking at our pre-teach algebra support class. Algebra 1 is arguably our biggest barrier to A to G because if a student is not successful in Algebra 1, it tends to set them on a trajectory of, of non-A to G completion. You need to pass Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 to meet those requirements. And so students who did not receive a C or better, which is what's required to be A to G eligible in Algebra 1, tended to go on a non-A to G path. And we wanted to intercept that early on in the student's educational career in high school. And so what we've piloted this year is a pre-teach Algebra 1 support class. And that's a little bit different than some of the support classes that, that, that have been piloted in the past or tried in the past. Because what this does is it takes our illustrative mathematics curriculum. They've already created a pre-teach side-by-side curriculum for students that lines up with the daily Algebra 1 lessons. So what the design is, is the student will, in class 1, receive a pre-teach uh, Algebra 1 lesson, which is designed to set them up for success in the actual Algebra 1 lesson, either the following class period or the following day, depending on the schedule that they're on, uh, so that these kids can be active contributors, not just um, a, a little bit cautious, possibly, in class, but confident. Sometimes these kids are not confident in class, and we know that being able to explain their thinking in math is critical. Uh, so these kids get a pre-teach. They go onto their algebra, and the idea is they are able to um, track and follow and be successful in that Algebra 1 lesson, and then it repeats over and over. We are piloting that in all four of our comprehensive high schools this year, and what we are seeing so far is pretty impressive results. Uh, we took a group of students who were not successful in semester one of algebra and put them in this pre-teach and then algebra one class. And so far, depending on the school, depending on when we measure grades, over half of them at every single site are now getting a C or better in algebra one, and that's, um, that's really exciting. Clearly, we want to continue to increase that number, um, but it's... It's been really, um, really exciting. These students will um, hopefully end the year with their Algebra 1 credit and will be ready for and prepared for geometry to go on and, and continue to be A to G eligible. So that is one of our expenditures. The second is data science math. As, as I mentioned a little while ago, Algebra 1, geometry, and Algebra 2 are the three math requirements to be A to G eligible. Algebra 2 is tricky for some of our students. Um, it's, it's a complex class. 
they take a year off of algebra to take geometry, so there's um, there, there's there's a, a, just a, a, a time gap, uh, and it can be really difficult for some of our students, um, especially ones who have not mastered all of the core concepts in algebra one. So what the UC system has done, and this has been um, coming out of UCLA and Stanford, is they've created a data science class, which is an alternative to algebra two. It meets the algebra two requirement, but it's a different possibly more hands-on approach um, to, to mathematics, it still meets the standard. Uh, it engages in a different type of way. And so we are proposing that we offer one section of data science next year at our comprehensive schools, initially targeting students that may struggle in Algebra 2. That will be our initial target, but with the possibility of expanding um, well beyond that as we understand the program a little bit better. Um, so a student who either wouldn't take Algebra 2 which we have a number of students that don't because they're not required to for graduation, we hope to entice them to say, why not try data science? Um, or a student that might struggle in Algebra 2 um, getting a C or better, why not take data science um, to, to stay on that A to G pathway? And then finally, increasing our support for our ROP college and career specialists at Estancia. Currently, Estancia only has 25 hours a week. Um, and we want to bump that up to a full 40 hours a week to get more support for college and career counseling. We think um, part of that's gonna be just building knowledge for A to, G, uh, A to G completion for our students. And then to create a second college and career position that will be shared between Cloud Campus, Back Bay, and Early College. And we think that's gonna be really important too um, to give that same level of service to those three schools. So it'll be one more counselor that serves those three areas. Again, um, amongst other things to build knowledge about a to G. Very briefly, here's an overview of the expenditures, how we're proposing to spend the $1.2 million. This is over three years. Yes? Quick question. What were the three campuses you mentioned for the roaming counselor? Uh, Back Bay, Cloud Campus, and Early College. And Trustee Yelsey, you had a question. Well, I, I was going to wait till the end, but oh. the group, so that's fine. I'll do it now. Back to the pre-teach algebra one. How does that work? Do they take, does that take the place of another course? Or is it within the... Yeah, yeah. so, so, so um, it could take the place of another course, but what our students are in right now, it, it, it is their seventh class um, for those primarily ninth grade students. Um, so they would take all their same classes, but then they would have a seventh class to serve as that pre-teach. So they would have the pre-teach and the algebra at the same time. I mean, not at, not at the same time, but in the same semester. Correct, okay. yep. And, and generally rotating days, so Monday, pre-teach, Tuesday, actual algebra lesson. And the other, the other, I think, a beautiful thing about that is the actual algebra class is not full of only students in the pre-teach. It's mm -hmm. all of the kids. Mm -hmm. So the kids go into uh, you know, a, a, a class that has all, all, all of the students in it, and they're able to be successful within those classes. Um, the, the, the big highlight here with the expenditures, this is over three years, so we really think it's important to fund these ideas for three years as we grow, build capacity, um, and continue to expand. So we're not just looking to fund this for one year. Um, all three of those things that we talked about, we're giving a section of pre-teach to each one of our comprehensive high schools and a section of data science as well, funded over three years. Now again, we may expand those sections and offer more, um, it would just be funded from a different account line. So if the need is there, uh, that certainly is not off the table. Um, and then finally, I just want to go over very quickly some of the metrics we're going to look at because as, as with all good initiatives, we want to make sure we measure the progress. This is not every metric, but these are some of the big metrics we want to look at that we will measure success and say, ultimately, did we, uh, did we accomplish what we wanted to accomplish? Some of the formative things that we're going to look at, clearly we'll be looking at grades in Algebra 1. Um, consistently to make sure that those students are experiencing the success. Um, number of students who su successfully complete data science, a another number that we'll be tracking. Um, number of Algebra 1 pre-teach completers who successfully complete geometry. It's one thing to finish algebra. Did we prepare them for the next level? So we'll be tracking that. And then two years out, did they complete Algebra 2? I think that longitudinal data is going to be critical. And then number of college and career student contacts. That's just one way for us to measure um, impact and how are these counselors um, reaching all of our students. And then finally, they're all designed to build A to, a to G eligibility rates. So we think that if all of those are increasing, it will have a positive impact on A to G.
Trustee Matoy had a question. Um, actually, it's a comment. I was pleased to hear that one thinks that, well, if you take a, if you add this in there to help the students, you're taking away from something. And it's so important for our kids to have the elective choices and the things that are exciting. I, there are very few math geeks like me that came to school for math, but <laughs> definitely would come to school for choir or athletics or computer science. So I'm excited to hear that that won't be a takeaway, but it does take money to add that extra period into a child's schedule. You've got, we budget on a six period day, so all the extra augmentation costs, and I think this is an excellent use of that money. Thank you. Trustee Ursoilu and then Trustee Anderson. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the presentation. So I have a question, kind of a policy question. On how does how different is our Newport Mesa high school graduation requirements from the A through G requirements? Um, how much would it take? Because we all got this CSBA journal this month, and the tagline of the article was, high schools can help by making A through G coursework a requirement for graduation to boost, in particular, Latino attainment. Um, so I'm just curious, are we very far off? Would that be a possibility that we could ever explore to just have our graduation requirements be A through G requirements so that everyone who graduates from Newport Mesa is A through G? Is that? Yes. And so if I could respond to that, Dr. Shaka, because I love policy. So thank you. <laughs> um, that's something that we could take a look at. As a district, we're not terribly far off. And most districts are almost all in line. And the exceptions usually are the outliers that you will see and that we have here is the math um, and then the science. So you'll see that those are the two disciplines that give kids the most struggle. And so when you look at why a district doesn't align or why they are not currently aligned with A to G, it would be for your math credits and then your science. So if that is something that the board is interested in us looking at, that is something that we could do at a later time and bring that forward to discuss. Um, but you will, as you read and, ha and have probably been reading over the last year or two, a lot of districts have made an effort to do that. Um, and one of the, the concepts that Dr. Shaka brought forward with the high school principal team was the fact that math is a struggle for kids and hence why we're spending and investing and in augmenting the math program at the high school with the pre-teach and the data science as that alternative. And until recent years, the University of California did not have many math alternatives at the third tier. So it was very traditional, like you and I and everybody who maybe went through that system knows you had to hit algebra two or higher. There were not those alternatives. And today there are several alternatives. And so that's exciting for us as we move forward that after we have a year of success of data science and we have those metrics of success that we could look at that and say, students can pass this class and do well. This is something that we could look at as our third year. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. And then I just had one other question about, um, you mentioned the barrier of the parent-student knowledge of the A through G. Um, are there certain schools that you've noticed that barrier is larger than others, or how is it across the schools? Yeah, the primary barriers that we noticed were at Cloud Campus, Back Bay, and um, Early College, just because we didn't have that same resource. So I think that was the observation. Um, it, I think there was a general understanding that at our comprehensive sites, um, knowledge was was continually being shared, and we were doing a good job building that. Mm -hmm. And then will those counselor position, will they engage, is there a plan for them to engage parents, or is it just the students? Uh, absolutely. Does that look like? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Trustee Anderson and then Trustee Crane. Thank you. Um, that was basically my question. I was wondering if we can possibly separate out the metrics, because I would like to see student context as one and family context as one. Um, when I'm talking to parents, often they'll say they did, they don't know what's being offered on our campuses. They don't know how to have those conversations with their children um, because they're not sure of the process. So I think um, one of the things that I would really like to see for those three schools, but also for our existing counselors that I don't know that we do, is to go out to the elementary schools, go to PTA meetings, go out to our feeder schools, um, particularly because you know, we've learned through some of the middle school electives that some of those you have to test in. So if kids aren't ready in sixth grade, I mean, I, I'm concerned about that pipeline. So do do we have anything in place right now where we're tracking, like, the family contacts? I'm not sure if we track the family contacts through uh, school links. We're actually doing some, some student surveys. I'm not, I, I'll find out and get that information for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I, I agree, you could never have too much um, 
information about A to G because it's complex. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Crane. Yes, a uh, quick question. Currently, what is what's our uh, what is the percentage of our student graduate graduates having completed A G? It depends on the year, but it normally dances around 62, 63 percent. Okay. Which, which is uh, a, an impressive number considering that the Cal States and UCs are, are, are designed for about 33% um, hmm. and Newport Mesa has about two thirds of our students, um, but we wanna continue to, to build that up. Okay, thank you. Okay, any, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was wondering, um, from my personal experience at Back Bay, if there was anything that we could do when we're talking about parents and interacting with them, uh, as trustees were saying. Um, in my school's experience, a large problem is a language barrier with the parents. The students, they get help for their language barriers, but the parents don't, so it's harder to interact with them and help them get their education at home. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point and certainly something we'll incorporate in this, but a fantastic point. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Thank you, it's a really great discussion and thank you for this real great report. Thank you all so much. Okay. Next, we will move on to community input on non-agendized items. Trustee Crane. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board if the speaker prefers. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Anonymous, um, and I'm not quite sure who that is, so we're gonna move on to uh, Allison G. Anonymous, don't okay. we have to but we just need to, if, and that's fine if you want to put that on the card. You'll just need to state it on the um, for the record. Your name, please. Um, my name's Nadine, okay. and I'm um, Dr. Bartow, Dr. Smith, uh, esteemed board members and guests. I am a teacher with. Excuse me. We need the little pointy part to point to your mouth. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's okay. Thank the you. audience in the back couldn't hear you. This is the first time I'm doing this. <laughs> it's scary. Yeah, thank you. Take a deep breath. No. Thanks for being here. Yes. <laughs> Um, President Bartow, Dr. Smith, esteemed board members and guests. I am a teacher with 14 years of experience at NMUSD. I am a Latina woman and I grew up predominantly in a Caucasian city. As the only Latina student in school, my mother always told me to work harder than anybody else because people were going to judge me by the color of my skin. Over time, no matter how hard I worked, I still was faced with discrimination. There's a ton I could share, but all the discrimination I've endured was nothing compared to the discrimination that I went through for not getting vaccinated. Because I made a personal choice, I was feared. By friends, family, colleagues, strangers. People were scared to be around me. People did not want to sit down at the same table with me. People were afraid to hug me. People thought I was going to kill them. I don't fault them. Our president and the media perpetuated, perpetu I can't even, perpetuated this. Last year, the president mocked vaccine hesitant people by saying, I have the freedom to kill you with my COVID. Headlines on CNN stated, ditch your unvaxxed friends and family. The weekly testing of unvaccinated of staff is not confidential and demeaning. When weekly testing first started, a letter stating that I had a test was placed upright in my teacher mailbox. At our site for many weeks, the tests were placed in a hallway near the teacher's lounge. I test here at the district and my testing kits have my last name written clearly written on them on the front, at the front office. I know multiple unvaccinated staff who suffer from depression and anxiety as a result of how testing was handled at each site. For the first time in my life, I had to see a therapist for all the unjust mandates placed only upon unvaccinated staff. This weekly testing of unvaccinated staff is completely asinine because of all the friends, family, and staff that I know who have gotten COVID while being vaccinated. It's asinine because the job does not prevent transmission or infection. It's asinine because the Supreme Court blocked weekly testing for large workplaces. It's clearly evident some institutions have completely mishandled the pandemic with its flip-flopping mandates. So I ask you to do the right thing and stop the weekly testing on uh, unvaccinated staff. You'll never know the harassment, discrimination, and pain we have endured. Enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have, next we have Allison G. Hi. 
Hi, good evening, Newport Mesa Board Trustees and Superintendent Smith. You have sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the United States of America. You have failed to uphold both of these constitutions. You have attempted to make law in the absence of due process of law by issuing ordinances, orders, mandates, and other statements that create a color of law but are not actual law, that you do not have the authority to do so. Therefore, you are in violation of your oath of office. Tonight, you are being served with a notice of intent to file a claim against your surety liability insurance policy. You are hereby put on notice that you will need to immediately halt all enforcement as it relates to unlawful COVID-19 policies and procedures now and in the future. You might not realize this yet, but each of you is personally liable for a predetermined amount stated in your policy for damages per claim. In your policy, each occurrence is one claim filed against your policy. Each occurrence carries a predetermined deductible that you must pay prior to the insurance company covering the rest of the damages. Each of your names has been added to a box. Each box contains multiple claims to be filed against you. If the actions outlined in the notice are not met within 48 hours, we demand that you cease and desist. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Laurel Gregory. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Danielle Mills. Thank you. And Cole Woodward. Like uh, I it's kind of hard for me. Every time uh I go to school, like it it like hurts me every time uh every time I like see them like uh wearing a mask and it just really hurts me on the inside and uh and like it's really uh heartbreaking. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we move on to Christopher Gammer. I'm sorry if I didn't get that right. Excuse me while I turn this phone on. All right. Uh, good evening, Newport Mesa. I am Christopher Gannier, resident, parent, and architect. The people here in Newport Mesa support the local schools and expect to be served by them. I noticed that uh, most of the principals, teachers, and administer administrators are very focused on serving one type of student to the neglect of every other type of student. That type that they're hyper-focused on and dialed in is the type that go to college. The rest of the students are stigmatized when they should not be. Our society needs everyone to participate, not just college graduates. I challenge the school board to open up the schools to serve all students, not just those that are bound for college. Please visit lpoc.org for a more inclusive political party. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, now we move on to item 17, superintendent's comments. Yeah, I wouldn't um, comment publicly on pending litigation, but I'll say this about one of the mandates, and the students mentioned this, um, as we've notified our families starting March 14th, we're excited that our students and their families can make that choice. Uh, we're excited to see not just the classroom, as, as you pointed out, but the activities, uh, the athletics, the performances, and all of those things. Dan, I've never heard a student want to see their teacher's face before, but that speaks to how much you care about your teachers. Uh, in any event, we'll see that, um, and, and, and we're, we're excited for you to have that choice. And for those parents to choose to continue to send their students masks, that's, 
their choice also. So we've, we've made that announcement as it relates to the um, mandates on employees. We're hopeful. We work closely with our labor allies. We're hopeful that the state and Cal OSHA uh, come out and, and share whatever changes are made there. And as soon as those changes are made, we'll report those to the communities we do. And, um, it, it wasn't a question. It was uh, a strong position, and I would just say personally, I agree that the schools have to be for all students. Um, as we said earlier, uh, the system shouldn't choose for students, right? So we should prepare students to be able to choose, but they should be able to uh, make those choices and be prepared to do so. Uh, and our system has to support all of them, uh, wherever they go. And so I would just say, here, here, uh, absolutely agree with you. So, all right now. Agendized items. You can do that. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you? Uh, yeah. So now we're moving. Oh, we're moving on to community input on agendized items. Um, Trustee Crane. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to twenty minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board of the speaker, if the speaker prefers. Okay, and uh, we have Fernando Barragnon on item 21B. Hello, members of the Newport Mesa Unified School District. My name is Fernando Barnone, and I am a current junior at Estancia High School. I've been here for the past few meetings. The last one, I was unable to express my thoughts to you regarding the new theater placement at Estancia. And I am here today because I care about the future of that area where the new theater will be located. I don't think that the location that we as students call Senior Lawn should be demolished, and neither do most of the students at Estancia. I've been going around school for the past few days, reaching out to students and bringing aware awareness to what will happen for this location. I've started a petition that currently has over 200 signatures right here. And I did this because I feel like the students that go to Estancia feel the same way. I have several opinions left saying for not, for, to not have the theater on the senior lawn we love our senior lawn, and seeing it dest destroyed would not only affect our mental health, but our well-being as students at Estancia. I think the idea of a new theater is great. I think it is good that the district wants to invest, but not in the er area that we are currently um, involving in talking about. Um, I think there are room for improvements, but but right now that location where where um, it's being like headed towards is not the ideal location. There is, is much concrete and at, at our school and it would cause traffic jam. There are other locations like the back of the school near the baseball field. There is so much parking space and it can be a possibility for the placement of the new theater. Although it may just be an area that is a part of the school. Students from past and present uh, share many memories there. Students gather to socialize before school starts, during nutrition, during lunch and after school. We resort to this place because this place is unlike any other in our school. We are able to feel calm and welcomed even with the stress that we carry on as we continue our classes um, through for periods one through six. And thank you for listening to my thoughts. Thank you. Now we move on to number 19, consent calendar. I have a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. In a second. 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 Okay. It was moved by Trustee Matoye, seconded by Trustee Weigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Barto. <coughs> Aye. Trustee Matoye. Aye. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Ersoilu. Yes. Trustee Weigand. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Okay. Seven zero. Thank you. Moving on to public hearing action calendar, Ms. Olson. Yes, thank you. 
Uh, this evening begins our negotiations with uh, NMFT. Uh, it, it sets the stage for the 2022-23 um, school year. And so tonight we have before you um, and ask you to open for a public hearing the Sunshine document for NMFT's reopeners. Thank you. Okay, so we will begin 20A public hearing of Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers initial proposal to Newport Mesa Unified School District for reopener negotiations commencing 2022. The public hearing is now open at 7.03 p.m. Do we have any speaker cards submitted? There were no speaker cards submitted. The public hearing is now closed at 7.03 p.m. <laughs> and item 20B, we would ask that the board receive Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers initial proposal to Newport Mesa Unified School District for the reopener negotiations for 2022. Do I have a motion to receive the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers initial proposal to Newport Mesa Unified School District for reopener negotiations commencing 2022? So moved. Second. <laughs> It was moved by Trustee Crane and seconded by Trustee Anderson. Roll call vote. Trustee Bartow. Aye. Trustee Matoye. Aye. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Ersorlu. Yes. Trustee Wygand. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Okay, now we move to the pu item 20C, public hearing of the Newport Mesa Unified School District's initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers for reopener negotiations commencing 2022. The public hearing is now open at 7.04 p.m. Uh, what, there were no, no speaker cards were submitted. The public hearing is now closed at 7.04 p.m. Item 20D, approve Newport Mesa Unified School District's initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers for reopener negotiations commencing 2022. May I have a motion? So moved. May I have a second? Second. It was moved by Trustee Matoy, seconded by Trustee Wygant. Roll call vote. Trustee Barto. Aye. Trustee Matoy. Yes. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Ursula. Yes. Trustee Wygant. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. 7-0, thank you. All right, we now move to discussion action calendar. 21A, approve the 2021-22 second period interim report of district financial status. Mr. Trader? What we've been waiting for. <laughs> it's a math thing. Good evening, it's great to be with you tonight. Uh, so let's talk about... Uh, second period uh, interim report. And uh, by Ed Code uh, 42130 requires the, the board certify financial condition twice a year. And so that's why we are here tonight. And so by the time that we're done here in the next 10 minutes, um, you'll know what the financial condition is that the proposed changes in budget between um, November 1st and January 31st. And you also see the actual financial uh, transactions from that time period too. And we'll also provide some uh, multi-year forecasts for you, uh, refreshing those. And you, uh, we will recommend a certification, a positive certification. You'll be able to delight your friends, neighbors, and constituents with a positive certification, which actually just means that we are a going concern for the current year and two years out. So that's a uh, great thing to be able to do. So let's talk about uh, the reporting cycle. When you think about it, July, we start the state budget. In September, we, you get your unaudited actuals. And then we went to you um, in December with the first interim. And then in January, the governor proposed his budget. Here we are in March with the second interim. You look forward to a May revise here in May. And then, of course, uh, the 22-23 budget will be adopted in June. So let's take a look at what the revisions are, the proposed revisions, and uh, revenue increase. Now, uh, I was on a plane the other day, and uh, they talked a lot about rough air. And, and so, um, you know, these are changes that normally I, I personally don't like to see <laughs> because they're big. They're, um, these are um, large changes, and, and we wouldn't want to see these large changes 
midpoint during the year. However, this is reflective of what we're going through in terms of COVID and the funding that we're receiving. And so you are seeing some rare, fairly large adjustments mid-year, and we'll explain those. So revenue increased. Um, when you take a look, here we are at June adoption. Here we are at first interim. And then here we come in at second interim, and we're going to add uh, some property tax adjustments and lottery adjustments. Uh, there's been some robust uh, performance on the property tax side, which is helpful. And then um, we're also looking at some fairly large uh, increases in terms of uh, funding, uh, mainly Medi-Cal, expanded learning opportunities, uh, lottery and community support. Now, community support, we're used to seeing that at this time of year because mm -hmm. we adjust as, as the year goes along. Um, but uh, uh, expanded learning opportunities was a fairly large adjustment. Um, so then let's take a look here at the expenditures. And expenditures, again, here we are at June adoption, at first interim, they're coming up. And then second interim, we see tracking with the revenue some fairly large adjust adjustments. Now, we did have a utilities correction that's something we don't normally like to see. Um, you know, when, when uh, in our methodology of, of budgeting, sometimes at least for utilities, um, we, we track historically, well, uh, the previous year was, was a low utility year because of COVID. So we had a little bit of an adjustment there. And then actually, we'll call it a correction. And then uh, we also, uh, for staffing, supplies, services, mostly associated with the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant rolling in. So those are those adjustments there. Other financing uses, again, here we are at June adoption, first interim, second interim, really no changes there. And then uh, taking a look at the um, uh, ending fund balance, our ending fund balance here at June, first interim, and then second interim, just a slight increase of $142,000. So ending fund balance is remaining uh, relatively stable, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. So then let's take a look now. The last time we met at first interim, uh, the board, uh, Trustee Ersoilu, uh, asked for an update on our COVID funding. And so let's take a look here at the COVID funding. So overall, when, when we look at this, there's basically you know, federal uh, funding and state funding. And what we have recognized to date is about 31.2 million, 31.3 million in federal funding. And then on the state program, uh, we're looking at, at a 16.2 million roughly. Now, when you take all of this and take what we've spent so far and what we have encumbered, we're at 84% spent. Mm. So that should give you a good feeling like we're on track to, to spend that money. And it's been a lot of money. And you might be asking, well, what were those things um, that we're spending it on? And it's, it's all uh, uh, staffing essentially. So um, you think about it, here's uh, to call them out, uh, instructional assistants, community school, school community facilitators, expanded summer school, counselors. teachers, computer supplies, custodians, counselors, health assistants, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, behavior specialists, instructional coaches, social workers, technology support technicians, teachers on special assignment, reading intervention support personnel, psychologists, hotspots, social and emotional support services, and there is some supplies, there's HEPA filters. That's one thing that we can't seem to get through FEMA, so um, uh, we're, we're there. And by the way, we, we did really well, well with FEMA. We placed a, a $2 million uh, claim with FEMA. They accepted that, Ooh. so we're looking forward to, to getting that. That's a helpful thing. But So it, and it, it, uh, it's great to be able that we could put all that money towards um, support in the classroom. Uh, to make that happen. Didn't have to uh, That's cool. use it for other kinds of things. So let's take a look there. And, um, and let's look at uh, what the multi-year looks like. Now, you've seen this slide before. Um, so when you look at this, is a nice line. This is the total line there. Includes all the revenue. And then um, you, here's the LCFF, and that's basically uh, property taxes. So you, this, is, this is the driving force for revenue. It's a, essentially property tax. And then uh, come in here, there's the federal, and you see a little bit of a bump there for federal, which is great. We'd love to see that. And then coming at the state level, and again, the state uh, is a little less dramatic, but riding fairly high, um, more so than they ever have. 
And then uh, you look here at our other local, and that's pretty um, uh, flat. And then let's take a look at our revenue and expense and the alignment. We always like to see that they're aligned, mm -hmm. and, and that's a great <coughs> line. That's a great picture. Mm -hmm. Although you look at 23, 24, we start to, uh, the red line starts to get a little above the, the green line. And we will have to deal with some, we'll have to make some adjustments in the 24, or actually 25, 26 year. Um, but what we, we, uh, we're confident that that's going to be, um, that's going to be pretty smooth. Not, not a whole lot of rough air there, so. And then let's take a look here. Um, just summarizing, you know, the state budget is favorable, but um, <laughs> expenditures are increasing. They are, but they're manageable, and we're doing that in a prudent and manageable way. And then um, we're stretching to meet your your directives, and uh, but we're financially positioned to to take care of COVID and 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 all of the you know economic uh, and other things that are happening right now. And uh, with that, then, uh, we recommend uh, positive certification. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. I have a question from Trustee Anderson. Thank you. Um, thank you for this great report, as always. Um, I was wondering, I love that we are using 84%. Are we going to get to 100% by the end of the school year, or is there a way? Uh, I'll let you get to know first. Uh, yeah, great question. So the... Uh, we will get to 100% in when the money runs out in 24, 25. Um, and, the, and, and the reason the reason for that is these programs have different ending times, mm -hmm. and um, uh, but we are on track. We will not leave a cent on the table. <laughs> I promise you. That. Thank you. And I was wondering. Um, I know the the GER, the Governor's um, Emergency Education Relief. Um, fund that it was on the one page that had the, the um, thermometer um, and it's under federal because I know that money is coming from the federal government to our state governor have you heard any whispers do you know anything or like possibly if that money will be extended longer through the state because I know we have a bit of a surplus is that something that might happen or I don't know I, I wish I did um, I, I know I know that their gear has been something that um, w we've asked for more time on, actually for more dollars, because mm -hmm. um, the state can provide uh, more in that regard. But we'll see um, here, hopefully, at the May revise. Thank you. Thank you, and I I don't see any questions, so I'll jump in. I'm just really excited to see all of that funding going towards our summer schools and our computers and just additional um, educational resources. Thank you for detailing that out. And all the social emotional support. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, do we need a motion? Uh, so I do need a motion and a second. I will move that we approve this 2021 second period interim report of the district's financial status. Second. second. Oh. Things. Just have to do rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. I'm not sure. Rock, paper, scissors. Trustee or sorry. It's real close. Um, okay, roll call vote. Student board member Moss Elliott? Aye. Trustee Bartow? Aye. Trustee Matoya? Aye. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ersoilu? Yes. Trustee Wygand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Okay. Moving on to 21B, reject all bids received for bid number 112-22, Theater at Estancia High School. Jeff and Otto have done so much hard work and they've talked so much over the last two weeks, I told them I would take this one for them. Um, you've, you've been in consultation with council. Um, it's in the item. We had multiple bid protests during this bidding process. It's staff's recommendation that you reject all bids, make moot the protest, and we'll reset the process. <laughs> May I have a motion or any discussion? Yes. Have to move and second. I, oh, sorry, move in second and then we'll discuss. I apologize. I have a motion. Motion. To move. I move, but I also have a comment. Okay. okay. So, Trustee Elsie, may I have a second? Second. second. Trustee Ersoilu? Okay. Now we have discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that the public is aware from this that this is not, this is just on the bid process. It has nothing to do with actually our commitment to build a theater at Estancia. They're 
two separate issues. This is totally unrelated. It's unfortunate that this happened, but it was because of the um, the firms that were bidding. So we had no control over it. Okay. Uh, Moss. Um, and that's that was my question, so it's answered. <laughs> well, thank you. Any additional? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so then we have a roll call vote. Student Board Member Moss Elliott? Aye. Trustee Bartow? Aye. Trustee Matoya? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Wygand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Okay, 7-0. Okay, and then we are going to move on to 21C. Uh, approving CSBA delegate assembly election for 2022. And that goes to me because I'm a sitting delegate. The Orange County School Board Association has a subcommittee of delegates that um, are the policy policy writers and voters honors. And um, every year it's on a two year cycle. So some are off, some are on. I'm not up for reelection this year but we have a ballot before us and I wanted to give a recommended slate to our board for discussion. And it goes to the person who is a delegate. I am not all knowing and all seeing. Um, I, I recommended that we vote for Michelle Bartow, um, Lauren Brooks, Carrie Buck, Candace Candy Kern, Anne Marie Randall Trejo, Barbara Schulman, and Michael Simons. It's a balance of new people on the delegate assembly versus incumbents. It's not elect everybody that's always been there all the time. It's so it's very balanced. And I've worked with many of I've worked with most of the I've worked with all the incumbents, but I've worked with most of the people and they're 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 student minded, they're policy minded, and they are bright people. That's just my recommendation. And a question: We cannot give more than one vote to a candidate. We vote as a block. We cannot give. We vote as a board. Our board but makes the recommendations. We can give seven votes to one person. No, no, we, no, <laughs> we can't. <laughs> yes, stag, stag the much bag to the I mean, we would love to give seven yeah. votes to Mrs. Bartow. <laughs> Ms. Ripley, yes. To Michelle Bartow. Yes. No, we have to pick no more than seven. So if there's somebody of the of that you think we shouldn't have at all, that I've recommended, and I'm okay with that. Just Trusty discussion. Crane. Trustee Matoya, can you tell us a little bit of, about Michael Simons? He is a representative from the Huntington Beach Union High School District. He's, pardon me? Oh, Same you're just, okay. His bio is in the agenda. He, yeah, his bio is in the agenda, oh. but I have worked with him as, he is a high school district, so it's diff, if different from ours because they have no elementary schools. The Huntington Beach High School District has Fountain Valley, Ocean View, Huntington City, and Westminster school districts under their umbrella that feed into the Huntington High School Union School District. It's very different. I like us better. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Any concerns about anybody? That no, it was for me. It was just interesting. There's there's so many people that have been on boards for such a long time. So. I don't, I don't feel as much as there's a balance. There's, most of the people have been on for about 15 years on their boards. Oh. Um, but I, I, I trust there are several on here that I agree with. So I will trust who you recommended for the others. Thank you. Can I get a motion in a second? I, I, I move that we approve votes for Michelle Barto, Lauren Brooks, Carrie Buck, Candace Kern, Barbara Schulman, and Michael Simons. Second, and Anne Marie Randall. And Anne Marie, Rand Marie Randall Trejo. I right, second. It's been moved by Trustee Yelsey, seconded by Trustee Crane. I'm looking for my uh, Roll call vote. Student board member Moss Elliott. Aye. Trustee Barto. Aye. Trustee Matoya. Aye. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Ursula. Yes. Trustee Wygand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. In case you're wondering, I'm looking for my master so I can hand a clean copy to Mrs. Fish so she can submit our ballot. There it is. Thank you. 
All right, um, we're moving on to, thank you, thanks very much, um, approving the schedule of board meetings July 2022 through June 2023. And you have that schedule in front of you. I certainly want to thank Trustee Crane. She, she saw that we missed uh, a, a month. I, I was trying to sneak one in. <laughs> Staff and I talked about, hey, I think we can pull this off. We can't pull anything by the seven of you. Uh, so the dates are there for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to get, uh, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Since, uh, you know, I made that suggestion. <laughs> Second. Okay. It's been moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Wygand. Any discussion? Okay. I may sound silly. Where are the dates? <laughs> yeah. I mean, do we have a piece? Do we have them? No, on a piece they're, of paper they're, right they're in our. They're in our okay, just wondered if I didn't. I missed something right here on my dais, so I'm fine. Thanks. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. Uh, Thank, Thank you. Yeah. I right. do have. Um, oh, oops. Are we doing the study sessions on a different at a different time on a different calendar? I don't see any of those on here. We used we scheduled them where there were big gaps. So if we don't have big gaps, then. Well, we still need study sessions. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, we'll work with you. I hadn't done it with you before, so have a conversation about how we want to do that, structure it, look at the year, think about the timing of some of the items that I that you might want to talk about that I've heard you mention. So yeah. absolutely have to have those. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. I, I'm impressed by the eagerness of this board to have more meetings. That's excellent. <laughs> I was going to say, knowing this board and the special <laughs> meetings we've had since I've been here, I suspect extra meetings won't be a problem. <laughs> uh, roll call vote. Student board member Ma Moss Elliott? Aye. Trustee Barto? Aye. Trustee Matoye? Aye. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Ursorlu? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. All right, moving on, thank you, to informal reports, superintendent. I'm kind of glad uh, Dr. Bolton isn't here because he's just piling on tonight with all of the celebrations at his school. We also found out today that the culinary team mm -hmm. won state, yep. <laughs> not just CIF, state, and they're going to D.C. for the national competition there and I had a chance to tour that facility and meet students and their amazing instructors and the reason I went there is they I like to see the schools and the students but also they had done this food service and they made a black bean burger I didn't even know that was uh, legal in Orange County that you could <laughs> do that but they did and it was the best non-meat burger <laughs> I've had and my whole family except for me uh, are all at least vegetarian, some of them are vegan, and it was that good. So I went in to compliment the students, and then they told me all the other things they were working on, and they said, watch for us at State, and they won it. So I just want to compliment these amazing students and, and the athletes, and uh, yeah, what, what an amazing group of young people we have the luxury and blessing to serve in this community. Um, I, I want to I comment on community engagement because uh, we've mentioned one, but now we've had two of our community forums, T. Winkle uh, and then at Ensign, and th there have been robust conversations, and, and folks have said, I don't know if anyone will show up. Let me tell you, uh, for the record, right, it's being recorded, lots of people are showing up, mm -hmm. and they're commenting, and they're putting their their voice, uh, not just in the room, but on paper to be recorded. And uh, Carrie and the team, Dr. Torres and the team are doing such great work. They're, they're taking all of that. They're also surveying the folks that can't be there, surveying students are gonna put all that together in this work. And as the, bull, as the board rather established the goal to have more meaningful community engagement communication, this is what, in my experience, that looks like. Uh, and so I just want to thank the team and let folks know we're going to continue to do it um, at CDM and Costa Mesa. We're also having our LCAP forums. Uh, and Vanessa, I know, has been in the room to see uh, how Dr. Torres has done it. And we're going to see a lot of the same type of engagement, uh, which, once again, will, will be powerful. We've heard expanded learning opportunity 
program is the P in that. Once again, the California Department of Education have sent their team down at their expense to help our district build a model program for our students. The second time they've done that, they're going to schedule another meeting. Uh, Michael Funk, the head of the program, had shared that this is the best plan he's seen thus far. There's still a lot of meat we have to put on the bone. But to be at that stage in the planning process, dreaming big, not worrying about how someone could say no. Like CD said, we're always telling you no. Don't worry about that now. Think yes. And, and the team has. And it's, it's been inspiring. So we'll continue as, as we get more in that area to present that here. And we'll be exciting to see that and to take some of those dollars that you put up there on your, on your bar chart. Um, with that work, we're already looking into community schools and met, we've met with community partners, uh, Trellis, Jennifer Friend and I, Project Hope Alliance have met. We're setting up a meeting with other folks in the community to say, what, what does that look like? Um, I saw a Hogue facility last week that in my mind represents exactly what that element of a community school looks like, where you bring folks together on a campus and you meet the diverse needs. And we know our communities have diverse needs. Um, so we're going to continue to do that work. CDE is going to help us a little bit there as well. We mentioned advocacy and certainly uh, money around the GER funds. We continue to, to make some noise there, but we also have to step up and, and get a little louder about having the state use non-98 dollars to pay down stirs and purrs because that's a benefit that helps all of us ongoing. We also have to make more noise about UTK funding not coming to community funded districts. In my uh, opinion, it's discriminatory that they say, uh, because of your area code, you don't deserve this. Figure it out on your own. It's an unfunded mandate. And I think we have to amplify that voice. And we're, we're engaging our folks that do that work. Uh, Edgar Zazueta is, is his name, and he's a great advocate. We're making sure that the folks at AXA and other places, CSBA, are doing that on behalf of our 18,000 students. And then lastly, um, considering the action the Board of Education has taken to reject the construction bids, the escalating costs, the input of our students, I'll be meeting with our team to review potential alternative site locations at Estancia High School with the goal of evaluating the feasibility of maintaining green space in the front of the school and constructing the theater project in a prominent location along Placentia Avenue at the scale intended. So that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to board member reports and committee reports. Um, we always start with Karen. Would you like to go first? I, I will. I would like to share to share with Trustee Crane because we did so many things together, focused on the arts. Um, I went to the Costa Mesa Zone, all or all band orchestra, all st all student orchestra. So it was K through twelve. There was half the gym was K through six students, <coughs> excuse me, and the other half was the fabulous musical stylings of Sandy Gilbo, the instructor, in, instrumental instructor at Costa Mesa High School. Well, I loved hearing another fabulous rendition of Hot Cross Buns. <laughs> they, also did, they also did Queen, so it kind of shows the broad range of elementary school. But what hit me the most was at Costa Mesa High School, the way that the, their gym is selected, the stands are all up at the top. It's a lot like um, UCI's gym and some of the coll collegiate gyms. When we did this the first time, the bottom gym floor was filled with people from the entire school district. The band were the bands of the whole school district. It was really fun because you had the whole school. We've done such a fabulous job, our music departments and our art departments, that the gym was full with the zone of Costa Mesa zone only. So that Corona Del Mar zone has to do their own, Newport Harbor has to do their own, and Estancia will do their own. And 
that feeling gave me goosebumps while I was sitting there, this poor woman who sat next to me who doesn't know me from Adam. I'm going, oh my gosh, do you see? Look at this. She's good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Strange lady there. And <laughs> there she's talking to me. I, I don't know you. Do I? No, you don't. But it was so exciting now to see do. that grow. Yeah, now you do. Remember my name. Um, then we moved on. Mm -hmm. we did. Go oh, ahead. I'm oh. handing it off to you. Oh. <laughs> well, we, we, had, we had the... Uh, <coughs> The VAPA uh, session on Saturday, which went from 9 to um, 12.30, and basically that's a group, basically it's all the, um, visual, and all the visual and arts uh, teachers who are the lead for their campuses all meet along with the community partners and some district officials as well. And it's, it's, uh, it's a long, it's a long, period of time, but it's very, very, very effective and impactful because uh, we get to hear from the arts teachers that are at the different zones in the campuses, and there's a, they provide a lot of insight. And so um, Ta Tamara Fairbanks, who is the uh, TOSA for the VAPA programs, um, for one, this year we increased the TOSA contract from a 60% contract to 100%. So Tamara Fairbanks is strictly a VAPA TOSA, which is wonderful. It's basically a message that we're setting, sending to our community that we, the arts are important. And so the teachers are feeling very supportive. Um, so her theme was regroup, reimagine, and rebuild. And I thought that was really uh, powerful, those three, three words, regroup, reimagine, and rebuild, especially post-COVID. So um, that set the tone of the three and a half hours. And um, I, I just think that it's, you know, Shar and I left the meeting very um, engaged and, and very um, impressed with the hard work that the, our arts programs are doing out there. And um, it was nice to have Lori Hernandez also spending her Saturday morning with us. Thank you. And um, as a result of this, we're actually going to be meeting with um, Ms. Hernandez in the near future to discuss how we can further the arts in Newport Mesa. And, and one of the things that was very exciting by hearing the groups was by listening to the community partners, and there was a list of 25. There were only seven partners able to be there that Saturday, but there were 25 partners listed on an agenda that we had, and the offers that came from them that were, well, if you're interested in doing this after school, if you're interested in do, we don't only do this, because we know some groups like arts and learning, I've known since I was a principal back in the dark ages, and they all would, they would come in and help us put on our elementary school plays. And then they said, oh, well, no, but we can also do dance and we can also do this instrumental group. And, and they were so eager to let us know how they could help us and That's how right. we could use our expanded learning to, to offer the arts, which is what we're thinking of. How can we serve our community and understanding that our job, our main job is our nine to three teaching, which is, I know those are not the right hours, but the nine to three teaching part of it. But before school and after school, we need expanded opportunities too. So it was exciting to hear from them and all the creative ideas. I mean, believe me, if we had unlimited money, that group would have Spent it all because it sure is easy to spend. So it's very exciting. It was a very exciting meeting. And then we followed it up mm -hmm. with <laughs> with attending the Renee and, Se Renee and Henry Segerstrom Concert Hall. That's the new one where the string ensembles from Costa Mesa High School and Estancia High School performed. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have any idea what the invitations came from, but it was their string groups. And again, my mind goes back to, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we had to take the viol some of our violins and have people restring them in order to make them into viol violas so that there could be two parts going on in an orchestra. And at one time we used to teach all sixth graders got a block of time with violins and a block of time with trumpets and a block of time with, with clarinets. And let me tell you, when your office is near the multipurpose room, you're very aware of those six weeks of time periods, especially the trumpets, because um, they're loud. And 
and our kids just did so well. They composed themselves. They were up there. Estancia is a group. I like to say it's small but mighty. They, they performed as if they were a... Um, um, oh gosh, what's it called when you have them out to your wedding? Like a five-piece band, uh, or string quartet, only it was a string octet. And they all did very well and played very interesting and complex pieces of it. Mm -hmm. And it was exciting to see. And Tamara was there for all of them. And one of, one of our parents, more than one of our parents, but one of our parents who's a concert um, violinist for the Pacific Symphony was there because it, she wanted to hear what was coming up and where... What, what do we offer to strings? So it's a, it was an exciting afternoon. Moving on, uh, Costa Mesa United. Or is it, oh, or the the youth sports. Well, I didn't know if Mrs. Orsoilu and okay. Mrs. Wagon. Well, to I'm going to jump in and do my report because it's okay, short. Good. I feel like you guys are all going to piggyback on every. And I don't want to. And I don't want to be the one who's last because I've been saying enough things. So. Oh, I like uh, I wanted to just say that I also I attended the Newport Harbor Zone oh, concert. Um, it was really, really amazing to see a lot of the, Kaiser, their orchestra was fantastic. And the band from Mariners was like 90 students. I was amazed. Was so impressive. Um, and then watching um, Ensign and, you know, they kind of were apologetic with how little progress that they've made, but I thought it was amazing. They did such a good job in the high school as well. It was just a, a really impressive uh, group for the amount of time, considering many of these students have only been playing since January. So it, it sounded like music. It was really, really great. I also have a trumpet player at home. It does not sound like music. <laughs> He's not in that band. Um, <laughs> and, he didn't make um, we all attended the Ensign and the T. Winkle Town Halls. Um, what I, one thing I wanted to add was there were so many great ideas, but watching what happened at Ensign afterward was really impressive. There were a lot of parents who were really uh, passionate about having some kind of drama program go all the way through and how creative they got in order to figure out how to make that go all the way through from, from Heights through uh, Ensign to Harbor. Um, they're taking it upon themselves to figure out and work with, uh, I'm sure, Carrie, uh, to figure out how to get a summer camp going for drama for fifth through eighth to build that pipeline out of the regular, um, outside of the regular school day and, you know, during the summer and to not lose that enthusiasm. So that, that was great to just see when we get creative and we think of how instead of know um, what people can do and, and really bringing people out. So that was wonderful. Um, last but not least, I'll go into a little bit of the advocacy um, stuff that I've been up to and legislative report. Um, I also attended Sacramento Safari. Um, one bill that we already heard about, AB 1614, um, the only reason I bring this up because it's not super applicable to our district. It's for raising the base with Prop 98 funds, and we're we subject to a different <laughs> funding formula. Um, I know, however, that a lot of the um, CSBA, PTA, and um, I think Meritsuchi is sponsored and are asking boards for a resolution. So I just, I'm not suggesting that we do or do not do that, but more informationally, like if, if you hear talk of that, um, their, that is their push to push that through. And again, it, while it might be helpful um, for other districts, it's, it's not specifically applicable to ours. Um, and then additionally, just had the opportunity to uh, hear some of the other uh, COVID-related uh, bills coming through and kind of a, a, just a different perspective than what we typically hear in our district and um, just the importance of advocacy and speaking with those senators because um, in many cases the perspective and view that they're coming from is just vastly different than what I hear a lot of our constituents say. Trustee Cray or? Yeah, just very quickly, um, we, I attended the Newport Mesa Schools Foundation meeting a couple of weeks ago and the teacher grant application period has closed. Uh, currently they are reviewing all the grants and they will be announcing in May um, at the banquet, in-person banquet uh, on May 4th. And again, it's always such a, a wonderful group to work with. Um, and I did want to comment on the fact that it was amazing having kids back in the boardroom. I mean, how, how amazing this energy, this is, why, this is why we do our work. And just to see so many kids in front of us just really um, was very impactful for me tonight. And I wanted to say thank you, Fernando, but he just left. I wanted to thank him for coming back because I do know 
I noticed he was up at the podium at the, our last meeting, and then he yeah. had to leave because we had to go into a recess. And so, um, uh, Fernando, if you're going to watch us at home, thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> And uh, uh, thank you. And then lastly, I did want to recognize an exceptional science teacher at, at Coronel del Mar's uh, middle school who is, is retiring as of 228-22. It's uh, Julie Oblock. Um, she came to CDM at, in 1995 and served us so well. And we wanna, I wanna thank her personally for her, decor her decades of service um, for the kids in our community. So Julie. Enjoy New Year, New Beginnings. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of piggyback that I think could be, you know, we've talked about doing some before and after school things. Um, while I did part of my student teaching at Kelly Brook, I did part of it at West Park in Irvine, and they had the orchestra or band play every morning as the kids were arriving. Mm. So it was like an extra 15, 20 minutes, and it was really cool to have the kids walk into music. So that, I think if we can come up with innovation, innovative ideas, ideas like that, I think that would be great. Um, I attended the DWAC meeting, and the um, ed tech team were there, and that was really helpful. Um, one thing, though, that I continue to hear from parents during that meeting um, is that they are requesting parent computer training at the school sites. Um, not necessarily just on some of the programs that we use, um, but on just computer basics, maybe having like a one-on-one -on -one class and different steps. Um, I think the reality is a lot of our younger students were helped in the past two years during COVID by older siblings, not by their parents. And I think we still need to continue to do that work with parents. Um, they shared that in DUAC. Um, I also was able to attend the CTC advisory, um, council, advisory Council, and it was wonderful. They are, it's, I'm so proud of the, the team that works on all of that. The opportunities are incredible. Um, and tomorrow, actually, through the county at 10 a.m., is the Orange County um, Workforce Pathways to Apprenticeship. And I know um, a lot of us are really passionate about having opportunities for students that are beyond college, um, as we've shared, I believe. Um, and I also was able to attend the T. Winkle Electives Forum. That was amazing. It was our best community outreach that I've seen so far, and I'm really proud um, that we were able to do that. Um, I continue, I sat at a table um, of two Wilson moms who went to Estancia, um, so they really know their school well. They know their area well. Um, and they, similar to me, I was like, we went to the same schools. They're a few years younger than me. But um, one of the things they continued to say, though, is all of the kind of arts, everything from having dual language options for students at other schools besides Whittier and College Park, having more opportunities for advanced art. Um, that's something they would like to see in elementary school, not after school, but part of the day. They think that that's important um, and creating a pipeline. So in elementary and then middle school and then for high school. Um, and they, oh, just lastly, thank you, Dr. Smith for um, community schools. I'm really excited to hear more about that. Great. Well, um, I think a lot of everything has already been said. So in the interest of time, I will I will be quick. And yes, Fernando, you left, but this I know is on video and I am so proud of you for getting 200 signatures. So I know you'll be able to see this on the YouTubes or somehow. <laughs> but that is just so impressive, this youth engagement like and having Moss up here and asking relevant questions and Dean giving your great presentation. So um, I'm not into seeing students so much. I'm into like hearing from them. So I was really excited tonight to hear from from so many and know that their voices are strong in this district and that's really impressive. And um, yes, the youth sports meeting that I know um, Ms. Metwe and, and um, Ms. Wygam were also at that again, props to Lance. I mean, I love going to these meetings and <laughs> every issue around like sports safety, like, oh, the parking lot doesn't have lights, Lance will fix it. Oh, the skate is not open, Lance will fix it. So we are just Lance. so lucky to have Lance, Lance, Lance. Um, just <laughs> taking care of all of these youth sports elements and facilities. And, and that's, I'm really grateful for that. And Lastly, um, I know one of the speakers in the beginning was talking about um, discrimination getting, um, you know, with COVID testing. I just hope that after March 12th, as the masks begin to come off of many people, there will, you know, the general 
majority will understand that for some of us who have immunocompromised or other health conditions, we're going to be slower to take the masks off. And I hope that um, bullying and things like that and discrimination toward those who remain masked uh, kind of stays in check in this district. So um, for that, I just want everyone to keep an eye open for their peers that still just may not be able to take their mask off yet. And that's okay. And they will eventually. And, and that's just life. So thank you, everybody, for being so open minded around here. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I attended all these that many things that you all attended. It was great. And um, yeah, the CTE advisory meeting was wonderful. Lisa Snowden and um, Annie Younglove did a, an amazing job at that. And I love to see all of our community partners. And so that was really wonderful and seeing, you know, kind of what's now coming down the, the pipe of, of CTE um, education. Um, another thing that Custom East United just a also props to Lance, and I think I learned more about aeration, which I guess my grass know, needs. Right? So, um, can we borrow those? Yeah, so, so thank you. Apparently, it's baseball season. That grass needs to be aerated. So we're, we're good on that. Can I add one thing to the yeah. to the sports and athletics? Oh, I shared it in the beginning. Oh, I have one more comment. Um, we also talked about. Um, Usage of Costa Mesa schools for the community um, as parks because we Costa Mesa is not Irvine and they didn't plan on having all the parks when they made the city. So we had a partnership and I know that the, that we're going into discussions about that and they asked if we could consider having some of the um, user groups that are part of it as part of the discussion because as we often know that we have the best of intentions and we set things up and the user group comes in and goes, well, why did they put that there when if they put it here, it would have been no problem. So that's all. They're not trying to be pushy or anything else, but they just would love to be, they'd love to be in the room where it happens if they can do that. And they also say that money is not an option. So they, they just are money always willing to help Costa Mesa that. United so. has grants available right. for our, principles to apply for. Well, I right. would say our city actually did a great job on Costa Mesa and they decided that the schools were going to be parks. So I think that <laughs> well, we good can for go them. back to that. Yeah. It'll be wonderful. And I also just wanted to give a shout out to all the students that were here that were athletes and it was just so amazing to see that they worked so hard. And I know from, you know, those water polo players and, you know, they've been playing that sport since they were five on up, you know, pretty much, you know, from the swimming lessons to everything and that dedication and then having one at the U.S. or U.S. national. Um, and we have three women um, that, you know, Newport Harbor just won the CIF. Um, uh, and they're probably ranked number one as well nationally, I would imagine. Uh, but then to have three of those um, girls go on to the U.S. nationals team is pretty phenomenal in our area. Um, and it's just something to be a sense of pride. So... Good for them on International Women's Day as well, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. I'm done. Well, everything's been mentioned now, but just <laughs> I, I was love being last. I was the third person on the CTE advisory, and it was terrific. Lisa Snowden and Annie Younglove did a great job. But it, I was reminded of it when the gentleman came up to give a comment today, and he was talking about how we only focus on students who are going to college. Yeah. And I thought, well, maybe we need to do a better job of informing the public of what we were doing with CT because I, I'm pretty sure if this gentleman had been on that meeting or knew what we offered in this district, oh. he might have a different idea of how we prepare students for yeah. other careers other than just going to college and then getting a career. So um, maybe we do need to. I feel like part of it is Marketed. we always say CTE because career technical education is yes. a lot. So if someone was listening, it's just kind of like yeah. education word yeah. soup. So I, th I don't, I mean, but I, I don't know. Because if we I think we all really are proud of what we're doing yes. in that Well, area, and so. people misinterpret, as Mr. Dr. Shaka said, we want our children college ready, not because we expect them to go to college, but we want them to have the skills the to be able to make the open. choices. Because we have seen what technical manuals look like for some of the jobs people take. And if you don't have a good grasp of math and English, forget it. Okay, Karen. Okay. <laughs>
figure somebody else Thank can interrupt. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> um, okay, I'll try to be quick. Um, <laughs> it is great having people back on campus, our volunteers, and that includes our veterans who were not uh, permitted to be on campus as if everybody else was not permitted to be on campus. And because that program, the Living History they Program, is very important to me and near and dear to my heart, um, I try to attend when I can. So I was at Back Bay High School, a couple of other people were there, and I was at Ensign. And going to the middle schools is a newer thing, but the kids at Ensign Middle School were so engaged in asking questions to the veterans. They went in every history class um, in one day. And there is one veteran, and he's everywhere he can be. He's 96 years old. His name's Billy Hall. And he is a veteran of World War II, in comment, veteran of World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. And there's very few veterans left they call them unicorns. That can <laughs> then do. say that. And he presents so well. And the kids just sit there and with their eyes wide open listening to him speak. So it's a great program. Um, and we'll continue through the rest of the year. Uh, music performances, obviously, we've all been to a lot of. Um, CDM has held several, which I've been to. And they also had their dance performance with orchestras last week. And as I was explaining to the, our superintendent, it's pretty incredible. I mean, it's like a first-rate Hollywood production, and their theme was a Hollywood production. Um, but as I said, they are the same as our student athletes who really excel at some of these sports. They've been doing, they've been dancing since they were five years old, and they spend every day doing that. So. Um, there's a reason that they're so good. A lot of them are going on to college to dance, and it's really impressive to watch. Um, and then I also benefited from the culinary team. Unfortunately, the time they told us was when they were, well, fortunately, the time they told us to come was when they were eating. So I did get to be oh. there for that part, which was great. But I've always enjoyed in the past watching them prepare when they have such a time limit and they are working on a little Bunsen burner, and they are barking out orders to each other, what they need. It's very impressive. And I recommend anybody who hasn't seen that, when they have another opportunity, to go over to the school. Because it's it's like being on Top Chef. That's what they're, that's what they're doing. Without the language. Thank you. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> people are nice to them, yes. Um, and then uh, just one last thing. I am looking forward to. Our students, again, having the opportunity whether they want to wear a mask or not. And I'm looking forward to being at schools and seeing a lot of smiling faces. So that'll be nice. It's great to see things getting back to normal, new normal, whatever it is. But there's a lot of activity at all the schools. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to adjourn our meeting at 7.54. Gee. Four, eight. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, wow.